I think you are muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, now it's good. Hi, so um, we're just waiting for your host to come in. His name is Om. He's in the waiting room now, I'm going to admit. Him. And then we can start. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Let me just see if uh, I can share the screen. Okay, yeah. He's working. Okay. You can see the full screen? Yeah. Good. So you're in Brazil? Yeah, São Paulo. <laughs> Good. I have an um, I have uh, connections with Brazil. Really? Yeah, with uh, São Paulo and uh, Rio and Natal. I saw you did something at USP. That's amazing. Right. Yeah, one of the professors there is a former student of mine, and there's a new professor who's joining. Uh, Elisa Ferreira. So she's going to start, I think, next year as a physics faculty. Yeah, USP is really renowned, so it's it's amazing. <laughs> the school. So let me just check if Ohm is coming. I think he'll be like two minutes. So just one minute. So he's just joining now. Okay, there he is. Great. Hello, Roman. Uh, very welcome to you, sir. Uh, uh, and thank you so much for joining in. Yeah, you're welcome. So you're having a lot of cosmology this afternoon. Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, so I think uh, that without uh, uh, further uh, 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 time scaling, uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, uh, so hello and welcome you all uh, to another lecture at the CYW Fair. Uh, this time we have the world-class cosmologist, Professor Robert Brandon Berger uh, with us uh, uh, from McGill uh, University. Uh, Professor uh, 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 Brandon Berger is, uh, is a world-renowned uh, uh, um, cosmologist uh, and uh, his field of work is on theoretical cosmology uh, and uh, he did his PhD uh, uh, from Harvard University uh, and uh, 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 was a postdoc uh, student under Stephen Hawking uh, at MTP uh, in Cambridge. Um, uh, and uh, uh, sorry once again uh, for my lagging uh, because at this moment in time I'm having some uh, uh, some throat. Uh, uh, problems. Uh, so please, uh, 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 now I would like to uh, request uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Brandon Berger uh, uh, to please uh, uh, start off. And uh, sorry once again. Great. So thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak. So it's a wonderful uh, initiative which you have. Uh, young scientists from uh, six continents it's quite impressive. So Africa, Australia, uh, Europe, South America, North America, and uh, Africa. So it's quite, quite remarkable. So I want to tell you a little bit about my field of research, which is uh, cosmology, theoretical cosmology. And um, so I have um, a provocative title, What Was Before the Big Bang? So, uh, this is uh, obviously a, a big question and uh, you may get a surprising answer at the end of this presentation. So I want to start out 
telling you about the field of cosmology and why it is of interest. And then I want to tell you about our current models that we have for cosmology. And then uh, I will lead you all the way to the most recent model, which is based on the merger of superstring theory and cosmology. So this is section four. Anyway, what is cosmology? So cosmology is a very old field, but it used to be a subfield of philosophy. Uh, people have always wondered about the origin and early evolution of the universe. So where did the universe come from? What is the Big Bang? Was there a Big Bang? What was before the Big Bang? So these were questions which have been with us for millennia. But what's changed in the last uh, 50 years is that we now have lots of observations about how the universe looks if we look beyond our own galaxy. And the second goal of cosmology is to explain what we see today. So I want to show you some pictures telling you what we see. First of all, like all scientists, we have instruments. But the instruments in cosmology are located at very wonderful places on the surface of the Earth, like in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And here you see an optical telescope. So with these instruments, we look at the sky. And any of you who've taken an astronomy class or uh, read astronomy books will know that if we look at the sky with a telescope, we see galaxies. So here's a picture of a beautiful spiral galaxy. But for us cosmologists, galaxies are much too small. So we will replace this entire beautiful galaxy by the point, and we will look further with more powerful telescopes. And if we do that, so if we look at the entire sky, and what you see here is the sky projected onto a plane, like you project the surface of the Earth onto a plane, and each dot corresponds to a galaxy. So first of all, there are a huge number of galaxies in the universe. And there's structure. You see there are regions, if you see my cursor, there are regions here where there are more galaxies than here. So there's structure and we would like to understand where this comes from. So we have other ways to explore the universe. We have microwave telescopes. And here's another telescope located high up in the Chilean Andes. It's the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And uh, it's a uh, radio telescope, and it measures the microwave radiation which comes to us from all across the sky. So microwave telescopes are located also other interesting places on the surface of the Earth, for example, at the South Pole. So this is the South Pole Telescope, which uh, McGill is involved in. And then there are even some very expensive telescopes which are in outer space, like this WMAP telescope. And they look at the entire sky and they look at the intensity of the microwave background, which is coming to us from different directions in the sky. And so with all of these fancy instruments, if you look at the intensity of the microwave background, which comes to us from all over the sky, you find this beautiful picture. So you see different colors means different intensity, but you see that no matter where we look in the sky, the intensity of the microwave background is to very good accuracy exactly the same. And it's about three degrees above absolute zero, which is cold even by Montreal winter standards. So now if you have better telescopes like the ones I just showed you, then you can actually resolve some very small differences in the temperature of the, of the microwave background. So here you see hot spots and cold spots in this microwave background. And the difference in temperature between the cold spots and the hot spots is less than a tenth of a per mil of the background temperature. So these are tiny differences, but they're well-defined differences. 
So again, you see structure, you see some hot spots, cold spots, but they are not randomly distributed. So we would like to understand the origin. Where does this all come from? So now what uh, scientists do when they have these beautiful pictures is they send them <clears throat> through black boxes to produce a boring curve. And so this is what I did with this beautiful picture. I sent this picture through a black box, which is spherical harmonic decomposition. And what this shows is the amplitude, this is the vertical axis, as a function of angular scale. So if, there were, if it was uniform, then you would have zero for all angular scales. If it were random, then you would have some straight line. But the data, which is these black dots, with some statistical errors and some systematic uncertainty, shows that there's some distinct structure on about one degree scale, angular scale in the sky. So there's a lot of structure. And we would like to understand where does this come from? And I will convince you shortly that in order to explain this, we have to go back to the very early universe. So this is a second goal of modern cosmology. It's to explain the patterns that we observe in the universe. And so it is this goal which makes cosmology really into a physical science. And then as good scientists, we also want to make predictions. So once we have a theory which explains what we see today, we want to make predictions so that we can test the theory with future observations, confirm it or roll it out. So these are the three goals of uh, cosmology. And it is this combination of very speculative questions with these hardcore science questions, which makes cosmology uh, a fascinating field to me. So let me now move on to the framework. So how do we, in order to um, answer these questions that I posed, we have to have some framework. And what do we see if we look at the universe? There's space and time. And um, then there's also matter. So our universe consists of space-time and matter which lives in this space-time. So now in order to describe the universe, we will assume that space-time is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity. So I'm going to be quite conservative in my approach to space-time here. And then the matter which we are made up of, this matter is described by physics. And if we look at low energies or large scales, then we can try to use classical physics, the physics that you learn in high school. Now on smaller scales or higher energies, then we need quantum mechanics. And that's not good enough to understand the origin of the universe. And I'll try to convince you that on even smaller scales, we need something that goes beyond classical physics and normal quantum mechanics. I will try to argue that we actually need super string theory, maybe. Okay, so this is the framework, space time and matter. Now, I don't think you've uh, had a course on curved space-time on Einstein's theory, because that you usually only learn in uh, graduate school in physics, not even in undergraduate school. So let me just give you a couple of pictures. So Einstein's revolution is that space and time are no longer absolute. So if you do high school physics, then you assume that you have a, a three-dimensional space, which is flat, and then there's time and matter moves in space. But no, space is not necessarily flat. If you have matter, matter curves space, time. And a way to illustrate this is this way. So you have some elastic material. This represents space. And I drew a coordinate grid 
on this elastic material. Like in high school physics, you draw coordinates in your space. And then I plunk a big heavy mass onto this space. And this causes the elastic material to distort, to curve. So this is Einstein's key revolution. Space-time is not absolute matter curve space-time. And then if you have a smaller mass like the moon, it then responds to the curvature of space. So if you set the moon out in motion tangential to the separation between the earth and the moon, so you set it out in this direction, because space is curved, the moon will actually start orbiting the earth. So gravity in Einstein's theory is not a force that acts at a distance, but it is response of matter to curvature. So you can do this experiment. You take some elastic material, take a heavy stone and take a very light pebble. And then you send the pebble all out in this direction, not with too high a velocity. And then you will see that the, that the pebble basically circles the, the big stone. And because of friction, it eventually crashes. So this is Einstein's revolution. Space-time is dynamical. Newton's gravitational force is a consequence of the curvature of space. And this, the exact uh, dynamics is described by what's called Einstein's equivalence principle. Now, I showed you what you, happens to space if there's mass just at one point. But if there's mass everywhere, then Einstein's equations tell us that space cannot be static. It will be either contracting or expanding. So the idea that space with matter expands is the key ingredient to cosmology. And this is a way to illustrate this. So here you have a visualization of a raisin bread. So you have the dough of the bread, and this represents space. And you have the raisins, and they represent the galaxies, which live in the space. You stick the raisin bread in an oven, and each raisin remains at the same position in the dough, but the dough is expanding. So the separation between raisins is increasing. And if you sit on this raisin here, you see that close by raisins move away from you slowly, but raisins which are far away from you move away from you fast. So Einstein predicts that objects which are close to you will have a recessional velocity which is low. Those which are distant will have a high recessional velocity. And this has been confirmed. These are objects which astronomers have observed. The horizontal axis is a distance from us, and the vertical axis is the velocity with which they move away from us. And so as good data, you have error bars, but you see there's a roughly linear curve. And this is a confirmation that the universe is expanding as described by Einstein. So this is our framework to do cosmology. And this framework is called Standard Big Bang Cosmology. It was developed in 1960, and it was given the word Big Bang Cosmology not because people wanted to be fancy, but because some people thought that this was a crazy theory and they wanted to make fun of it. So the word Big Bang Cosmology was initially meant for people to make fun of, a, of this theory. So the principles are that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So matter is uniformly distributed on large scales. That Einstein's equations describe the expansion of space. And standard Big Bang cosmology assumes that the matter that lives in the space is classical matter. So, it's stuff that form galaxies. So cold matter, you can think about this as stones. 
which have low pressure. And then there's also radiation, the radiation which we see in the microwave background. So, so this is the standard Big Bang cosmology. Okay. And we observe that the universe is expanding now. Therefore, in the past, it was smaller. And therefore, it was hotter and more dense. And therefore, in the past, it was expanding even faster than now. And if you evolve with a simple differential equation, then you find that at a finite time in the past, the temperature was infinity. And if you take a finite box of space today, the box that our whole galaxy fits in, then you find that at this time when the temperature was infinite, the box had zero size. This is the big bang. Now, obviously this doesn't make sense. No physics experiment will ever me measure infinite temperature. So what is the big bang? It's a breakdown of our theory. What was before the big bang? So the standard Big Bang cosmology does not answer these questions. It cannot be extrapolated to the beginning if there even was a beginning. Okay, so now why should we take this standard Big Bang cosmology seriously even a little bit into the past? And there are good reasons to assume that at late times, standard Big Bang cosmology does describe the expansion of our universe. So let's run the universe forwards in time, according to this theory. So we say the universe begins as a homogeneous and very hot fireball. It starts so hot that atoms disintegrated. The electrons could not be bound to the nuclei. So space expands, matter cools, and about 300,000 years after the time when I started my clock, then matter cools to the temperature where electrons can be bound by the nuclei. This is called the time of recombination. And this event releases light. So, Running the standard Big Bang cosmology forward in time leads to the prediction that there's a black body microwave background. So the prediction is the existence and black body nature of the cosmic microwave background. So now the Big Bang model was uh, first uh, speculated about in the 1940s. And when the famous Soviet uh, physicist Zelovich heard about this, he basically said, this is a crazy theory because if the theory is right, it, there must be a cosmic microwave background and there is no cosmic microwave background and therefore the theory has to be wrong. However, Zelovich was wrong because a few years after Zelovich said that, the microwave background was discovered this glow, which I showed you before. So here's a timeline of standard Big Bang cosmology. You have this very hot beginning, and then 300,000 years after this very hot beginning, the microwave background was produced, was released, and we observe it now 13 billion years later using these telescopes. So the microwave background is a spectacular prediction of standard Big Bang cosmology. And it tells us that you can trust standard Big Bang cosmology as far back as 300,000 years after this hot fireball. Okay, so let me show you how good this prediction is. So we can take the light, the radiation, this microwave background, we can let it go through a prism. And then the microwave background, it decomposes into its different colors, different frequencies. And this is the result. So this is the intensity of the microwave background at one, in one direction of the sky. 
as a function of frequency. And this is an experimental curve. And now everyone who's taken a science lab should be stunned because whenever you do an experiment, you have error bars. And indeed, this curve has error bars. And the error bars are smaller than the thickness of this line. So this is high precision verification that the standard Big Bang does describe the evolution of the universe um, until 300,000 years uh, after this hot fireball. However, it doesn't explain the origin. And it also doesn't explain why the microwave background has the same temperature everywhere in the sky. This is the horizon problem. And let me skip one slide and come back to it afterwards. And it also doesn't explain the origin of any of these differences in temperature. So in standard Big Bang model, there's neither an explanation for the fact that the microwave background is approximately isotropic, and it is impossible to explain the origin of all the nice things that we have in the universe. No explanation for galaxies, no explanation for uh, galaxy clusters, no explanation for microwave background in homogeneities. And this is an illustration for why there is this horizon problem, why we can't explain the isotropy of the microwave background. So I won't have many equations in this talk, but I will have graphs. So in this graph, the vertical axis is time. This is the time of a hot fireball. This is 300,000 years afterwards when the microwave background is produced. And the horizontal axis is space. So now this red line and this blue line, th this is us looking back in time at the microwave background radiation. So if we look in one direction, the microwave background is coming from here. If we look in opposite direction, the microwave background is coming from here. So now in standard Big Bang cosmology, there's such a small period of time between the origin and 300,000 years that no information could have traveled from this region that influences region A to this region that influences B. So no one could have said, have told B to have the same temperature as A. So standard Big Bang cosmology cannot explain one of the key features of what we observe. And okay, here's a, uh, another sketch of why it can't explain the origin of structure. So here, the vertical axis is time, horizontal axis is space. And here I'm using coordinates which expand as space expands. And this is the wavelength where we observe some inhomogeneities like uh, galaxies. And it turns out that in the early universe, this length scale is larger than the horizon. So we couldn't have, uh, there was nothing that allowed us to create the seeds which developed into galaxies today. So this went kind of quick, this explanation. But so let me stick to the um, horizon problem. Okay, so what do we do? We would like to be able to explain the data. So we ask for help from a friend. And the friend we ask for help is the particle physicist. And the particle physicist tells us that at high temperatures close to the Big Bang, classical physics breaks down and quantum mechanics and particle physics gives a better description of matter. And so the standard Big Bang theory breaks down. So in the very early universe, matter is a plasma of elementary particles. Now I have to tell you that in modern physics, particles are all described in terms of fields. And now there's a special type of field, namely a scalar field. And this can lead to a very different expansion of space than you have in standard Big Bang cosmology, namely inflationary expansion. Okay, so I'll now turn to this 
to what the second paradigm of cosmology is, namely inflation. So inflation is a simple idea. And the idea is that at some point in the early universe, there was a period of finite duration when space expanded exponentially. So A of T is the radius of a chunk of space. And the hypothesis is that there was a finite period starting at T sub I and in a T sub R where space expands exponentially. So now, what are the successes? This immediately can explain the isotropy of the microwave background. It can produce a spatially flat universe. And it also allows us to understand the origin of what develops into galaxies today. So there are many successes of inflation. So these data quantified in this way is explained with inflation. So how do we get this exponential expansion of space? We'll stick to our description of matter. We will take matter to be described by a scalar field. By the way, if uh, my voice, uh, if you lose my voice, please uh, let me know. Because I just got a warning that my connection is unstable. Good, so now, so inflation is the hypothesis that there was a period of exponential expansion of space. And to get that, you need slowly rolling scalar fields. Now you may be terribly scared of the word scalar field. Now let me try to make you a little bit less scared about a scalar field by giving you a toy model of a scalar field. So let's imagine that you have a table in your laboratory in the presence of gravity. And at each point on the table, you have a pencil which is pinned down, but it is free to oscillate back and forth. So at each point X on the table, you have a pencil and I can call the angle from the vertical phi to make it look fancy. I use a Greek letter. And obviously the angle can depend on time as well. So phi is a function of space and time. And I also connect the tips of the pencils by springs. So this is a toy model of a scalar field. So compared to the theory of light, this is simple. So with scalar fields, it is possible to get exponential expansion of space. So here in this graph, the vertical axis is time, the horizontal axis is spatial distance. And here, I will show what happens to the, which is a distance that light can travel, then the light will action exponentially larger than it will be without inflation. And therefore, you can make it so large that it explains why all points from which we see radiation, microwave radiation today, were within the same horizon. <coughs> and also, this red curve illustrates that uh, you can explain the origin of galaxies. This I won't mention. So these are the successes of inflation. In fact, this theory of inflation postulates that everything we see today, all of the nice galaxies, this is all a consequence of quantum vacuum fluctuations. So it's a crazy idea that we come from vacuum, from a fluctuation of the vacuum. But anyway, you can uh, do the math and you find that uh, it uh, seems to make sense. Now, what does inflation say about the Big Bang? Well, there was a period before inflation. There was a Big Bang. 
So inflation does not answer the question about what is the Big Bang, what was before the Big Bang. These questions are at the same level of severity as in standard Big Bang cosmology. Well, now if you approach the Big Bang, if we approach the point when the temperature goes to infinity, then unfortunately, this theory of scalar fields is no longer applicable. It breaks down. Now, inflation also has a number of conceptual problems. And in light of these problems, we need the help of another friend. And this other friend is going to be the string theorist. So I'm now going to, going to argue that if you merge superstring theory and cosmology, you can get a new and better understanding for the origin of the universe. So I will claim that the answer to this question is yes. I will show that this new paradigm can be tested with observations. And I will answer, I will give a tentative answer to this question. So this is the preview of the rest of the talk. Okay, so these are some of the problems of inflation. What is the scalar field that gives inflation? Why does it have special conditions in order to roll slowly? And then there are some serious problems. In, there's a singularity. That means that we cannot apply Einstein's theory of general relativity all the way back to the Big Bang. And there's also this transplanting problem which is the following problem. So here I look at the wavelength that corresponds to galaxies today. And we follow this wavelength back to the beginning of inflation. It becomes smaller and smaller and eventually becomes so small that we know that our theories will break down. So there's an internal inconsistency, at least in my opinion, in this inflationary model. And I stuck in one slide for Ohm. And this is this new twist to the problem. It's a transplanting censorship conjecture, which says that a picture like that is prohibited from occurring. Okay. So singularities are not physical. Inflation has a singularity. And so therefore it's incomplete. And Einstein's theory must break down at very high densities. And close to the Big Bang, the densities are very high. So therefore we cannot trust predictions made using Einstein's equations all the way back to where Einstein says there was a Big Bang. <clears throat> okay, so the message so far is that the current cosmological paradigm of inflation has serious conceptual problems. We need a new paradigm and we need a new friend to help. And a friend that I will ask to help is a string theorist. And then with this, with the help of this friend, we were able to come up with a new paradigm which is called string gas cosmology. And it makes predictions for future observations. Okay. So now, now you had the main course of the talk, and this will be the dessert. So what is string theory? So string theory is supposed to be a theory which unifies all four forces of nature at a quantum level, electromagnetism, gravity, and the two nuclear forces. Now, the idea is that the basic objects in this theory are not point particles, but they are elementary strings. Because we have many elementary point particles in nature, but according to string theory, these are all, these particles are all made up of the same type of elementary string. So those of you who play string instruments will know that with one string, you can produce different notes. 
So the different notes correspond to the different point particles which the same fundamental string can produce. So this is the basic idea, the starting point of superstring theory. Now, point particle theories can exist in any number of dimensions of space, but string theory is mathematically consistent only in a particular number of space-time dimensions, maybe 10. So string theory predicts that space has nine dimensions. This is not a problem, as I will argue in a couple of slides. Okay, so what I want to do now is to try to see what string theory could tell us about the very old universe. And the principle is that we want to use the new degrees of freedom which differentiate strings from point particles. So I want to use the fact that with a string, you can produce many, many different notes. And in addition, there's a new symmetry of string theory which says that strings on small spaces are equivalent to strings on large spaces. So I have the many notes of a string, and this leads to the fact that a gas of strings has a maximal temperature. And the fact that strings can wind space leads to this new symmetry, which says that physics at large radii at large scales is equivalent to physics at small scales. Let's keep on this. So let's take a box of strings with radius R and let's compress that box of strings and let's follow the temperature. So the vertical axis is temperature. So you start compressing the box of strings and initially the temperature will rise, but then the temperature levels off becomes constant and if you shrink the box of strings even further, eventually the temperature goes down again. So according to string theory, you can never reach infinite temperature. As opposed to with point particles where you shrink a box of point particles and you reach infinite temperature. So very interesting. So now the idea is that you start with this gas of strings you start in nine dimensions of space, all dimensions tightly wound by strings. Imagine a uh, donut and you wrap the donut with uh, elastic bands. The donut cannot expand unless you cut the elastic bands. But elastic bands, you can only cut them in three dimensions of space because elastic bands in four dimensions of space will never meet. So therefore you start in this phase of nine dimensions, all very small wound by elastic bands, namely the strings. At some point, the elastic bands will, the strings will unwind in three dimensions. Three dimensions can become large, only three, the other six remain small forever. So therefore you see that we have a dynamical explanation of why we have exactly three dimensions of space. It's kind of nice. It's the first time that we have, that we can understand why there are three dimensions of space that we see. Okay, so I'm looking at the clock, at the watch. So now if we... Uh, if it strings at a high temperature diagram time space and three dimensions can start to grow early on i can see what this and exactly the same predictions as inflation for the density perturbations so i find this curve even I even predict the amplitude right. All of these features are reproduced exactly like they are in the previous paradigm. So nice, but we need to make a prediction. And the prediction is that if we were able to measure gravitational waves from the early universe, we would see a difference from inflation. 
we would see a spectrum which is blue, which means it has slightly a larger amplitude for shorter wavelengths. Good. Now, what about the Big Bang? So according to string theory, the universe indeed was very, very hot and dense 30 million years ago. So in this sense, there was a Big Bang. There was a hot primordial fireball. But there was no singularity. And time doesn't end because there's no singularity. There's no beginning of time. So this is the answers that string theory kind of indicates. Okay, so let me try to wrap up. So you see there was a main menu and dessert. So part of the main menu is that cosmology is a vibrant field with lots of observational data. And a lot of the best telescopes are located in South America. And uh, some of the best uh, radio telescopes are located in Africa and Australia. And unfortunately, the population density in Europe is too high. And so very few good telescopes are located in Europe. So in astronomy and cosmology, we need international collaboration. So we've been able to develop paradigms, models of our universe cosmology, the standard Big Bang, which predicted the existence and black body nature of the microwave background, the inflationary scenario with which we can understand the isotropy of the microwave background, and we get a model for the origin of structure in the universe. But both of these models have a Big Bang singularity, and they have conceptual problems. So this was the main course of this talk. And the result was that superstring theory may provide a new paradigm, and it may provide a paradigm in which there is no beginning of time in which the Big Bang singularity is resolved. And it is possible to probe this paradigm. So this is what I want to leave you with. So thanks for your attention. Thank you so much uh, uh, for a great talk, sir. And now we have time for some after talk uh, uh, q and a so if any of you have any questions uh, so please feel free to to either uh, 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 speak yourself or to write in the chat box uh, uh, so actually uh, we have two questions from the uh, youtube uh, live streaming uh, so those two questions are from uh, uh, Jason Adams. And like uh, the first question is, Professor, are there vector and tensor uh, uh, fields too, like uh, scalar fields? And the second question is, can a similar procedure as string as cosmology be created for loop quantum gravity and entropic uh, gravity as well, as they are also quantum gravitational theories? OK, so these are advanced questions. So I'd, I discussed the scalar field and now vector fields, they definitely exist. And for, for example, the field that describes electromagnetism is a vector field. And uh, tensor fields, they also exist, the field that describes gravity, the field that describes gravitational waves, that's a tensor field. So that's the first question. Now the second question, second question is even more advanced because it, it refers to loop quantum gravity. Um, so the problem I have with loop quantum gravity is that it does not unify all four forces of nature, whereas string theory does. So, but with loop quantum gravity, you can also resolve the cosmological singularity. Okay then, uh, so like uh, uh, we have time uh, uh, for more questions. So if anyone of you has 
uh, a question uh, uh, please uh, uh, please uh, uh, feel free so actually there is one question here it's for motion pathing so uh, she says in the standard big bang model the general analogy of space time is that of a trampoline but how can we imagine a black hole in three dimensional space time that's how can we imagine a black hole so okay so let me go back to this picture. So the, let's imagine for a moment that this were the sun. Now, if we, if we were to compress all of the mass of the sun into a ball of radius of about one kilometer, then the distortion of space at the radius would be so large that not even light could escape. So um, let me give you Mitchell's argument for black hole. So you know that there's an escape velocity to get out of the Earth's uh, gravitational field. You need to give uh, a spacecraft uh, high enough velocity if you want it to, to leave the Earth's gravitational field. So now the, the same is true for the sun. There's an escape velocity from the surface of the sun. And the more you compress the sun, the higher the, this escape velocity becomes. And eventually the escape velocity becomes equal to the speed of light. So this is the way that I would, I would ask you to visualize a black hole. I'm not ripping the, the fabric here, but actually the equations of general relativity tell you that at the center, the fabric is ripped. Okay, thank you. I don't think we have any more questions. Let me just check here very quickly. If there's any more. Okay, so we don't have any more questions. And uh, thank you. I just wanted to thank you. It was amazing. It's a really, really great lecture. And I'm gonna hand it off to Olam to say the last goodbyes. Thank you. Yeah. So thank, uh, well, yeah. Uh, so thank you once again, sir, uh, uh, for giving uh, this uh, great lecture. Uh, and uh, if uh, I were to say uh, something personally, uh, then Dr. Brandenburger's work uh, has been a guiding uh, a light uh, 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 for uh, my research too. Uh, and uh, like in many senses, he is. Uh, like a mentor to me and I cannot be uh, more uh, grateful uh, uh, to him uh, uh, for today's uh, uh, time and thank you so much sir. Thank you for the invitation and so for those of you in India there's a great place for cosmology in India which is uh, Pune, Ayuka in Pune and for those of you in Brazil I know that a lot of you are in Brazil there are now a couple of young female faculty who are who uh, uh, are starting to work in Brazil. There's uh, uh, Leila Graf at, uh, she's in Niteroi. I think it's called UFF. And uh, then Elisa Ferreira is going to start at USP. So, so good luck to all of you in your careers. Now, some of you probably will not go into cosmology, but into things which have more direct impact for society. I actually listened to, to the part of the opening uh, ceremony which she had yesterday. And also to some of the profiles. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much. We're really honored. Thank you so much, sir. Good.
So enjoy the next talks or yeah. the, the group presentations. Okay. Um, so, okay, sorry, go on. No, 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 no. Uh, please go on, please go on. Yeah, uh, so if anyone wants to say something or, or else we're going to end the meeting here and thank you all for coming. Thank you. I will sign off. Bye. Bye.